Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. This podcast is devoted to exploring the science of rejuvenation, uncovering the most trusted experts, the must-have products, innovations, and technology in the field of vitality, aesthetics, new beauty, and cosmetic enhancement. Professor George Paxanos, I have listened to so many of your podcasts and interviews, and for me, it is such an honor to have you on the Ageless by Rescue podcast. I always say that the key to agelessness and everything that I've read is, you know, um, there are key things that have to happen. You have to have a healthy brain, a healthy skeletal system, and a healthy heart, and to have the honor of having you a gentleman who's mapped more parts of the brain than anyone else on the planet on the show is is really wonderful for me. Thank you for being here. There are a lot of people interested in uh, postponing dementia. We will age and the brain um, amongst uh, all other organs. Uh, indeed, uh, it is uh, the most evident uh, that is uh, uh, because that there resides uh, uh, what we are and uh, uh, it will age and I presume none of us will not be not demented by the age of 100 if we make it to that uh, but the wow but, that's not good news <laughs> yeah, the, the, in fact uh, one in two of us uh, will have uh, dementia uh, by about uh, the age of 86 either you or me uh, and the battle is to postpone that date. So instead of being uh, 86, or half of us, to be 87, 88. And there are ways that the neuroscientists have found to assist people with this. Uh, specifically, uh, well, to just put a disclaimer, neuroscience has not cured any disease but the neuroscientists are not altogether useless. They <laughs> Hardly have, useless. They have identified factors that uh, predispose the person uh, to dementia, uh, including Alzheimer's disease, uh, and uh, factors that uh, can postpone dementia uh, amongst the best. Uh, uh, probably the most significant factor is exercise, physical exercise, that is walking, running, swimming, rowing, cycling, or group sports, provided you don't hit your head, because hitting the head is a predictor for earlier onset dementia than otherwise. Uh, and uh, there are other factors, of course, such as uh, uh, good eating habits, uh, and indeed, uh, the cardiologists who emphasize the health of the heart, inadvertently, they have resulted in a delay in the onset of dementia. Uh, it might sound paradoxical to your listeners, but fewer people are dementing today at their 80th birthday than 50 years ago, of course, percentage-wise, not the absolute number, because we are more uh, now, and therefore there'll be more people dementing. But the percentage of people who are at their 80s and they are dementing is a smaller percentage than that 50 years ago. And this uh, scientists attribute to the emphasis of the cardiologists on the health of the heart, uh, diet, exercise, cessation of... Uh, uh, smoking. There are, of course, other predictors of uh, dementia, that is, that will bring dementia earlier, uh, such as depression, um, apnea, and people can do something about this, especially apnea, that is there. Uh, should visit their So clinic. by apnea, you mean sleep apnea, where you're yes. not getting enough oxygen during your sleep? Yes. Um, other things too. Uh, education. And of course, uh, uh, some claim that also remaining active intellectually assists 
it makes sense, but the data are not that strong, as strong as exercise. So the data on neuroplasticity through um, novel uh, experiences, um, brain training is not as strong as physical health changes. Yeah, yeah, that is right. And it's yes. funny because out in the, you know, um, uh, information uh, space, the buzzword is neuroplasticity, try new things, uh, learn a language, learn how to play a musical instrument. But you're quite right. There isn't nearly as much emphasis on the basics of, you know, environmental and lifestyle change. I, I want to ask you about the seminal work that you've gifted humanity, um, which is the Atlas of the Brain. And I want you to explain to our listeners and viewers what you did, why, and what this means. Yeah, well, I mean, I did it because it, it was interesting to me. So let's say what it is first, because um, I think that the, yeah. I'll, I'll introduce it by saying that um, you are the person who has mapped more parts of the human brain than anyone else. And you did this by uh, applying a stain which then created what you refer to as the atlas of the human brain. Uh, yeah, roughly so. That is, uh, I am the person who identified more parts in uh, the brain of humans and experimental animals um, than anyone before. Uh, uh, and uh, the way we did that uh, up to now, and I'll mention what we do now in a minute, uh, was to obtain the brain that is a solid out of the skull, uh, freeze it, uh, have a sophisticated salami slicer that costs $100,000, and take very thin sections. So you go from one end to the other of the brain, and then we study what is there, and we relate this to the brain of other animals, such as the chimpanzee and uh, the rat and the monkey and the bird. Uh, we've studied them and find what corresponds. And we make a, a three-dimensional map of uh, the various brains. Uh, it's like a Google map, but in 3D. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, then provide the coordinates if someone wants to uh, study uh, what is, uh, or to interfere with the part of the brain, stimulate it or lesion it or damage it and see what happens to behavior, to function, uh, then they can use our coordinate system. Uh, wow. And then uh, they also, well, you see, scientists love nothing more than constructing an animal model of disease, be it uh, Alzheimer's in the mouse, uh, uh, Parkinson uh, in, in also the mouse, uh, or uh, epilepsy in the rat, uh, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia in the rat. They love nothing more than doing that, but then they need a way to uh, 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 travel from the human to the rat, inspired by the human considerations, and test their hypotheses in the rat or the bird or whatever, uh, and then relate their observations back to humans. And we provide these maps so that they can uh, uh, travel uh, unimpeded uh, to test their hypotheses. Uh, and uh, we have found uh, areas of the brain of experimental animals and humans that are corresponding, much as you look at your eyes and the rat has eyes. And in fact, uh, the uh, areas of the brain that control eye movement in humans and rats are corresponding, uh, are the same. Uh, and uh, we establish what is the same in uh, rats and humans. Not everything is the same in the rat and human, but as it turns out, everything is the same in the chimpanzee and uh, human in the brain that is other than the size that the chimpanzee has half the size of uh, the brain, only 600 grams compared to 1.3 kilograms for humans. 
the areas that are found in our brain are also found in the chimpanzee brain and vice versa. So in whatever else you may resemble the divine by her in your brain, you are made in the image of the chimpanzee. Uh, I'm going to ask you just to pick up on that. On You mentioned the divine. And for me, this was a really interesting aspect of the work that you do. You know, um, is the brain who we are? Is it where the soul resides? Is it our super consciousness? Or is it merely an organ that helps the physical body function? Right. Well, brain has been uh, initially not in favor. The ancient Egyptians discarded the brain heedlessly and sent millennia of pharaohs brainless to their afterlife. Uh, it was Hippocrates, uh, the ancient Greeks, who uh, said that uh, from the brain and from the brain alone derive uh, our pleasures, uh, uh, gesture, uh, as well as our uh, pain, grief, and tears. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, if you look now uh, to buy a Valentine's card with a brain on it, good luck. I went to Bondal Junction. Uh, it's only the heart. <laughs> right. But it's in the brain. It's in the brain. Anyone who's gone crazy in love will know that it is most certainly the brain that controls love. Well, uh, I'm glad you agree, but this is not what is depicted. Uh, I went there to find a card for my uh, partner, and I was confronted in the injunction with 300 cards, all of them with at least one red heart on them, none of them with a brain. And uh, I wrote a letter in uh, the newspaper in the conversation, uh, and uh, darling, I love you from the bottom of my brain. Uh, and uh, a journalist from Melbourne called me and she asked, are you insisting that the heart has nothing to do with love? I said, in, if in a heart transplant, I receive your heart, I am not going to fall in love with your husband. <laughs> True. She said, what a pity. And he's such a lovely man. Uh, so uh, yes, the, the, it is the brain what we are. And this is evident uh, when uh, you, I mean, you mentioned, uh, mentioned Alzheimer's disease earlier. Um, we'll have an unwelcome visit, most of us, before we die. And uh, uh, our brain will shrink. And so will uh, uh, our uh, consciousness of various things. Uh, to the point where in, at first uh, you will, of course, just not remember recent events, you still remember the old events, then you will start losing the old events, you will not recognize your children, you will not recognize, you will not know who you are. And the only thing you can correlate that is the brain. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore this consciousness, which is uh, a big problem for neuroscientists because they don't know exactly uh, what uh, feelings are, why we feel love. They know where it resides, but uh, exactly how you perceive color, how do you're satisfied, you feel hungry, uh, or you feel happy, uh, that they don't know. Uh, but the, uh, there's no doubt, I mean, they, there's no debate on this, that. It is uh, the brain, if it were the soul. Well, I mean, uh, they, nobody used the word soul, even psychology. No academic psychologist that I know of uses the word soul. I believe none does, nowhere. There's no need to hypothesize that the soul exists something immaterial that possibly even survives death and goes to hell and is burnt for a million or whatever, infinity burnt uh, in uh, uh, intense heat. And it's, it is feel liberated. If you had any worries about that, uh, listen to the neuroscientists. There's no risk. You, your soul will not burn in hell. No, uh, just believe the neuroscientists 
that you do not have a, an immortal soul, that there's no need for the soul, and, uh, uh, and move on to something better in this world rather than something that there's no evidence for in the world that there's no evidence for. Uh, so uh, the uh, concept of the soul is not required for psychology. Uh, if the soul is where sensations uh, become perceptions, where uh, logic resides, where decisions are made, where love is manufactured, where memories are stored, then there is no reason to hypothesize its existence because there is already an organ which uh, performs these functions. Just imagine if you have a knock on your head, you might lose memory for the last couple of seconds or if it's a strong knock for the last few years. If uh, it was that memory stored in your soul, that should not be lost because memory, the soul is immaterial and it is not going to suffer from a concussion and damage to the brain. So uh, there's no need. Uh, just uh, free yourself uh, if you ever had any delusions of uh, having a soul and there are any worries. I absolutely do have delusions of um, having a soul, so I'm glad I'm having this conversation with you. Um, I'm going to ask you something about the correlation between uh, psychology and neuroscience and the where they meet and where you help psychology. So the work that you did was on a post-mortem brain, uh, and so you've mapped the human brain and uh, looked at it vis-a-vis -vis other mammals and um but what happens in that uh, I, I guess one of the first things I'm interested in is what about intelligence is there why is there somebody who is more intelligent than another and can you dial up intelligence or is this a genetic predisposition right uh, this question has been settled by psychologists some uh, many years ago uh, that uh, uh, because psychology, at least some of it, is neuroscience itself. Uh, that they're, they're the Venn diagrams that you exactly, uh, yeah, uh, the domains. But uh, it was D. O. Hebb, happened. To, I happened to study under him, who in 1949 described intelligence as something that uh, is formed by two things: genetic predisposition and environmental influences on that. So uh, if uh, uh, not everybody's uh, genetically endowed the same, the brain uh, might have had the benefit of uh, a gene working just a little bit longer in someone and conferred some greater predisposition for intelligence. Who knows what uh, are the genes for intelligence, but there would be. Uh, certainly uh, uh, predispositions. Uh, then, of course, uh, the environment. And the environment starts from early on, it actually even from the donation of the sperm or egg. But let us just stay be beyond the egg and the sperm to the zygote, to the first embryo, the beginning of the embryo. Now, if the mother is drinking, smoking, well, that's already a disadvantageous disadvantageous environment. So that person will not uh, actualize their genetic potential. If uh, the uh, family is poor, they are less likely to check for um, gestational diabetes or for factors which may result in uh, uh, insufficiency of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the uterus uh, uh, of the uh, placenta, the placenta, placenta, yeah, the placenta in the third trimester, and they don't take the appropriate steps to mitigate that uh, expected insufficiency because they didn't do the right uh, uh, prenatal tests. If they are poor they're already condemned. 
they will develop Alzheimer's disease uh, and other dementias earlier. Okay. Is so, that part of nutrition as well? Is that also part of the nutrition for sure? Uh, but not to consider the other Ill, uh, effects uh, that is even uh, uh, drinking themselves later on in life. Uh, all these things are predictors, poor diet, all that is are predictors, poor diet of the mother. You start from there, you are condemned from, uh, if you're poor, to contract dementia earlier. Uh, and Therefore, the intellect is affected both by the genetic endowment and also by the environmental influences on uh, this endowment. One thing that I've never heard anybody, but of course they might have said it, but I just haven't heard somebody say, is that motivation itself is environmentally and genetically affected, right? So you say, oh, all those poor people there, they don't care. Well, wait, you know, the environment in which they developed did not assist them to, to develop motivation, the drive. Uh, and, uh, and this is a societal problem. Uh, and um, I don't know if you remember when we were in uh, uh, the lockdown uh, period, all... Uh, um, uh, people over 70 had to be locked in, not to step outside their house, except the Aborigines. They had to be locked in after uh, 50 years of age. So 70 for the non-Aborigines, 50. This is an indictment on the society. That is, they admit that the Aboriginal population is more vulnerable because, obviously, uh, for many of the issues that affect health in pregnancy and later on in life. I do not know why there hasn't been uh, enough emphasis on the pregnancy period that is to, if you are going to, if you want to actually uh, bridge the gap to actually emphasize that very early period, which is the formation of uh, uh, the brain when we talk about, uh, so we talk about inception and um, those early pa developmental parts of the brain, let's go to the other side where you've had environmental stresses, depression, potentially drug and alcohol abuse or use, um, an accident that you may have knocked your head playing sport as a young child or older. What can be done now um, to slow down the inevitability of being the one in two people who's going to have dementia by 85, 86? Right. Uh, well, firstly, uh, yeah, for those who haven't aged yet, uh, to do the uh, right thing and avoid knocks on the head uh, and, and many other things uh, that are predictors, uh, living on busy streets and um, breathing exhaust, uh, having gas in your house and breathing exhaust. In Australia, it's still permissible to have a gas stove and a gas heater. Uh, and you have uh, a combustion of fossil fuels inside your house and you close your windows too, because otherwise you lose the, the heat. Uh, but uh, for the uh, person that's already had the course for through life and now, is, uh, has some spare time, well, then the exercise, that's the, uh, that will also make you feel bodily better, stronger, uh, avoid falls, which if you fall, uh, and if you, uh, of course, knock your head, uh, that knocks a few cells off, uh, and uh, it's a predictor. But can we reverse it? I, I understand the factors that will contribute, and I never I, even, in my wildest dreams, thought about gas heating and gas cooking, wow. Um, and yes, fossil fuels and yeah. lack of fresh air and oxygen in the home. Yeah. Yeah. But are there ways, do you believe that we're close enough to, now that we've mapped the brain and, and I understand now we're mapping it in a live brain through MRI studies, is there a, are we close enough to reversal? Because I was reading recently that, uh, th there was a case, I think, 
in the US where they were altering the CRISPR gene for an Alzheimer's patient. Um, but for some of the other things that you spoke about, like in just, uh, you know, when there's already a predisposition to brain damage, are there things that can reverse it or are we doomed? Uh, no, the... Uh... The best thing is to prevent it, uh, not a reversal at the moment, uh, or, or arresting is actually what you might be hoping to achieve. So the progression is slowed, but it is a progressive degenerative disease. You will keep worse, you'll be worse next year than this year. Now, the question is whether you'll be much worse or just slightly uh, worse. And uh, the uh, as to actually correcting what you have already and get better, uh, they uh, have approved in uh, the FDA in the US uh, medicine for this, but uh, a lot of the scientific community is against that. What uh, medicine is that? I uh, forgot the, the title of it, but the, the, it's also, of course, a hell of a lot of money, uh, which you can, uh, if you want to achieve societal benefit, you could spend the money in constructing uh, uh, pedestrianized streets so that they can walk and delay the dementia. But they argue that uh, this medicine is producing mini strokes and uh, uh, then therefore it is risky for some people produces penis strokes. Uh, so, it, so it's not without ri a risk. Uh, and so the, some, some scientists resigned from the body that approved uh, the medication. Uh, so don't hold. So the medication was for um, Alzheimer's right. patients or was it right. as a, a preventative? No. Uh, to, to uh, well, to 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 uh, impede progress and uh, and enhance uh, cognition at present in Alzheimer's patients. And there, I mean, there's a lot of talk about nootropics and um, you know tinctures, um, mushroom derivatives, and I know that there's a drug for um, narcolepsy that you know was very popular in Silicon Valley. Um, that was used as, you know, what they referred to as the limitless drug that would open up the neural pathways in your brain and help you focus better, think better, expand your cognition. Um, do you think that there is a place for that in neuroscience and, and in brain health? As long as the mushrooms are not poisonous, <laughs> uh, they um, wouldn't hurt. Uh, but uh, the evidence that I read of between comparisons between some uh, nootropic drugs, as you mentioned, uh, and uh, coffee was that there wasn't much in it. Uh, so uh, you don't have much di difference between coffee, which perks you up, uh, and uh, those uh, drugs. So uh, the uh, it's cure to start with, because you mentioned either a rest or cure of uh, dementia, uh, the cure I see uh, uh, far away, if ever. Uh, you could imagine theoretically ways if you identify a substance, let's say a breakdown product that accumulates in the brain, let's say uh, that produces those plaques, that's amyloid protein that accumulates there and interferes, the plaques interfere then with the function of the brain, that you can actually shake it off with ultrasound, uh, and they tried that. But when they tried on humans, it didn't work. Uh, strangely, in the rat, it worked. So what were they doing with the ultrasound? They were creating a vibration to remove the plaque from the parts of the brain that were affected? Shaking it off, yeah. Uh, and so you could theoretically think of ways of reversing the symptoms if you find the product, uh, the say degradation byproduct from the brain that accumulates there and shouldn't be there, should have been transported out of the brain, but wasn't. And you managed to encourage that product to get out. But so far, yeah, they haven't succeeded. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, to cure the disease, since it's not only for accumulation of byproduct, but it's also cell death, right? That's and right. Also accumulation 
of products not outside of the cell, but as the plaques are, but inside the neuron. That is, a neuron uh, needs to expel those things that are then uh, and useless, uh, but with age, they have inability to do that uh, a number of the neurons and they accumulate, they call them inclusions. That self-explanatory inclusions. They include something that they shouldn't, they should have expelled it. Well, if you have those, I can't see that be an easy way to expel them. They might find one day a way, but it looks uh, dif very difficult and they interfere. So you're not going to correct that person, even if you get rid of some of the other stuff that accumulates outside the neuron, and that might confer some, a conference, confer some benefit, you will still have the inclusions inside the neuron. And maybe one day you'll manage to encourage the neuron to expel those inclusions and improve even their situation. And then you're faced with a cell death that neurons die. Well, you mentioned uh, uh, the uh, neurogenesis. I think there is, as neuro, many neuroscientists, many people at large think that the neuroscientists discover something. This is known for a long time that there's you know, cells that are born and they have taken advantage, uh, the rehabilitation specialists, of retraining the person in maths, in language, in uh, skills, uh, but they will have to keep that into perspective. I tried that as well in uh, uh, mice with um, stimulation uh, because the cage is barren, but if you provide uh, some, uh, 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 the, the paper that you use to scratch the walls, the- Yes, yes, sanding sand paper. Sandpaper. Well, the, the mouse has texture to work in on this better stimulation of the brain. If you provide toys, if you, if you provide corn specifics and other mouse, then they interact and see how I, I could, uh, uh, I get it, 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 how could they encourage the cells to divide to produce more? Well, you can produce some, perhaps in some areas. You know, you have to view the perspective. You're not going to get uh, a, 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 a great uh, uh, leaps forward with this. You might, uh, amongst other things, and you could also consider that to encourage. Uh, uh, cell uh, prolif uh, proliferation, regeneration, or, or uh, greater division to let the cell divide longer to produce more descendants. Uh, but uh, the uh, that you will either cure, uh, uh, well, firstly, to cure dementia sounds to me far in the future. Uh, I heard the Nobelist uh, 20 uh, years ago who said that um, he came to Australia and he was sitting on a high horse and uh, <laughs> said that he uh, expects in 20 years time, Alzheimer's disease will be cured. Well, uh, there's no evidence for that. Uh, and 20 years have passed. Uh, so uh, let's be humble. Uh, there's uh, going to be difficult to cure uh, disease. It'll be uh, perhaps, uh, achievable to delay, to slow down the progression of the disease. And of course, the best thing of all uh, as a lifestyle from early on to do your exercise uh, so that uh, 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 keeping the motto of uh, uh, that uh, whatever is good for the heart is good for the brain. Professor Paxanos, I'm curious to know what you do, what your... Um brain uh, health regime looks like. I know that you're a, an avid cyclist. I know that you have written many books, you know, speaking to neuroplasticity and, and also a fictional book, uh, A River Divided. Um, but what else do you do uh, that you are fanatical about and uncompromising for your brain health? I never just actually considered solely for brain health. I thought that it would be better to avoid uh, alcohol 
uh, I have also trouble in, in coping with alcohol with my stomach being sensitive uh, and uh, that assisted in actually not drinking any alcohol. But really, uh, people should look at what the National Health and Medical Research Council suggests. If they said no more than one drink of alcohol per day. Alcohol is a neurotoxin. Of course, you can have a lot of fun with one drink or maybe two even more. And a few cells you can afford to lose, but if you do it consistently, more than one drink per day, uh, then uh, it is detrimental uh, to the brain. So uh, that's one thing incidental that uh, it came about. I also can't handle fast food uh, and um, that then um, put me on the other camp. So uh, it'd be fresh food, unprocessed. Uh, and uh, the, in terms of actual scientific evidence, they speak of the Mediterranean diet being uh, important in postponing dementia. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Mediterranean diet, uh, you have to look at what definition you would use, but certainly fresh things. Uh, seasonal things. Seasonal things, yes. And not uh, add, uh, too much meat, uh, to include fish, and not to ignore that. Uh, and certainly, what scientists have found uh, is uh, that uh, the uh, less you eat, <laughs> the better you are. If you uh, deprive rats of what they would, their cage mates eat ad libitum, free uh, and restricted by one quarter, right? So if they eat less, they, they don't have the food, you don't give them the food, right? They actually live. Uh, about a year more from three to four years and they remain lucid longer. So if anything is uh, actually harmful is uh, eating because obviously you have to go through a lot of uh, chemicals that are already in the food, uh, even if it's uh, uh, the, uh, and, and not specifically uh, if, uh, use chemicals, then they will find their way to the neighboring plots that are organic. And even there, you will get some. So, yeah, I mean, there are ways, but I didn't do that in, for, uh, I, I like uh, uh, my food, and so didn't do it specifically to remain uh, lucid. But of course, as you said, uh, cycling. Uh, and actually, you did mention the, uh, the, the book, and uh, a river divided. Thank you for mentioning that. It turns out that for me, that's actually uh, what took longer to do. That is, uh, twenty-one years uh, uh, than anything, and I consider that to be the best work uh, that I have done of my works. That, that. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, incidentally, it was. Uh, and uh, one, I was just before submitting it, a lady friend uh, saw me at the coffee shop in Bondi Junction writing it, and she said, how is it going? And I said, well, 21 years, still haven't finished. She said, my cousin's novel was published posthumously. <laughs> wow, if that's not a wake-up call. Yeah, and I said, I better submit it. Uh, well... Yes, yeah, so she was um, uh, giving me hope, you see. Uh, so uh, anyway, so yeah, in, in that book, I describe... Uh, it's a was... fictional work. It's a great, great premise. Yeah, it, it's a fictional work. And uh, if the things that we discussed just, just prior, they are inside the book, uh, because as it turns out, uh, that's what I knew. I wanted, of course, to... Uh, write uh, something that will take uh, uh, the reader uh, through the arc of uh, the hero and sensitize them on uh, the environmental predicament. Uh, and I uh, used things I knew uh, from uh, uh, neuropsychology and environmental science uh, to uh, do this. And of course, always uh, in... Um, uh, the style of a uh, novel, not, not uh, didactic. Uh, and uh, yeah, they will find things about the brain there 
um, that uh, yeah, I encountered. It was my journey uh, through the brain the last uh, virtually 60 years, really, that I've been looking at something related to the brain under the microscope or uh, in, uh, testing rats and occasionally uh, humans. Uh, and uh, and yeah. you poured that into the book. You, uh, I read that you have also mapped the um, spinal cord. Uh, is that in uh, post-mortem or is that through MRI? Uh, post-mortem, the spinal cord of uh, the rat, mouse, uh, rhesus monkey, marmoset and human. And, the and what did you learn about the spinal cord in that mapping process? Uh, well, what we described there, what it is there, that is identifying the various parts and using the same names as we gave for the uh, for, for each other, for the animals and humans. And uh, just to let you uh, know how uh, the field was poor, uh, that there was no diagrammatic atlas of the human spinal cord until we did ours uh, some uh, uh, 12 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we found uh, that there are variabilities, that is that not all humans uh, have uh, the, the same location where uh, the uh, nerves uh, originate uh, and uh, the uh, correspondences with the rat is good, but it's not absolute, there are differences. So that's what we provide because those uh, scientists who want to study in a, in a rat model of uh, a human spinal cord disease, they need to know uh, the correspondences uh, to make the right uh, inferences. Professor Paxanos, uh, what about uh, now that we're able to study uh, the atlas of the brain via MRI? What what have what have you found to overlay the original um, study and research and body of work that you created? Yes. The, it, the original work on uh, histology, that is post-mortem, uh, is uh, a very accurate, uh, but it depicts uh, something that people do not see on their screen when they have a, a living human person in front of them, because it's different, it's a stain, it's not an image from the living brain. And so we want to be uh, showing them uh, what they see and identify what is there in what they see. Uh, so um, uh, they uh, it, it be more real. Uh, it's exactly what they are seeing in front of them that we have mapped from one end of the brain to the other. That is, a, 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 a clinician or even a scientist would be lost to just have an image of a part of the brain. Where, where am I? What's behind this? What's ahead of it? What's above? What's below? Well, we present uh, at every one millimeter, uh, 160 levels, right? We present what is there. So and the how is that possible? I mean, that would have taken an enormous effort because everyone knows an MRI, you can't move, you, can't, you can barely breathe. Um, and to then map all those sections of the brain live, did did you do it? Were, were you the person in the MRI scan? My brain is uh, not suitable anymore. I put my colleague of 45 years of age uh, to do this, and his brain is scanned. Uh, the brain with age shrinks. And mine, uh, like, uh, like everybody else's, uh, has shrunk. Uh, not as much. I was told, uh, luckily, by when I recently volunteered for a brain scan, they wanted somebody my age, that uh, my brain did not shrink as much as expected for my age. So uh, they, they brought me not bad news, right? Uh, and uh, so his brain is the one that uh, was imaged, and he stayed uh, over a number of occasions, 20 hours in the magnet. Unbelievable. And he, he also trained not to move. And uh, so we got uh, 
uh, images which we believe uh, are unsurpassed. So we expect to be able to do a more accurate atlas of the human brain than what have, uh, is, uh, exists uh, as, as uh, so far. I, I have one last question to wrap up our conversation. And again, it comes from popular science and certainly I'm not a scientist, but there's a lot of conversation that the gut is the second brain and so much about gut wellness, gut microbiomes and brain health are linked. And of course you alluded to the fact that diet and the Mediterranean diet, and certainly the studies from Blue Zone suggest that diet exercise um, have a huge impact on brain health, heart health, longevity, lifespan, health span. But have you ever worked in, uh, in unison with a gastroenterologist or anyone else who's studying the gut microbiome vis-a-vis -vis the brain health? I haven't, but there are certainly articles in the literature that report such interactions there's even a journal uh, that's dedicated to that. Uh, the issue, of course, is that whatever the gut does, it will have to pass through the brain. That is the uh, hegemon. That is it. Uh, that is, I can remove your gut and uh, you'll still be Bahar. But uh, if I remove part of your brain, you will not be the personality uh, you uh, were. Uh, that is, uh, uh, their influences, even the muscles, when you exercise them, they release certain chemicals, which it is argued by some that find their way to the brain and they actually produce this euphoria that people have been attributing to endorphins. Uh, and who knows, it could be that they engage the endorphins. So whatever you think of, uh, peripherally uh, to affect your mood uh, to affect uh, whatever it is that uh, you want it'll be uh, even your lucidity remaining lucid uh, longer it will be through the brain uh, so yeah the peripheral system is there for something uh, but uh, it'll have to be uh, the brain that it works through uh, and uh, I mean, and you may, we mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, uh, IQ and how it is determined by a genetic uh, component, uh, the endowment and environmental uh, component. Uh, much anything else actually is similarly affected. And uh, in my novel, I have identical twins. Uh, they were born following a formidable discovery in uh, Israel. Uh, and uh, the, uh, this hum involving human cloning now. And uh, they were raised in different environments, one in affluent Sydney and the other in the slums of Buenos Aires. And uh, uh, much like different artists would sculpt different statues from the same block of marble, different environments will uh, form different characters, even in identical twins. So I have used things from psychology to uh, form uh, the two heroes according to the environmental influences on them, but maintaining some genetic predisposition. They will collide in the Amazon on the opposite sides. That is why it's called the river divided because they come accidentally from an accidental division of the uh, embryo when the uh, scientists, uh, uh, geneticists attempted to aspirate some cells to consider whether the embryo had any of the known culprits of disease and accidentally divided the embryo in half. And so uh, they are identical. And uh, uh, you will see how the genes actually influence behavior and how 
the environment also influences behavior, and that makes use of what is known in psychology and neuroscience at large, uh, that uh, identical twins, if one is, uh, for example, um, predisposed, has, is, is homosexual, the probability that the other one will also be homosexual is 50%, which shows that it's a significant contribution of genes, 50 times as uh, higher than if they were not related, uh, but still shows that the environment has an influence because it's not a hundred percent. Yeah, so you would see that uh, the nature versus nurture, or as now it is called nature via nurture uh, forms uh, behavior. And I hope that uh, anybody who might uh, look at it, they will get a, uh, an appreciation of actually the difficulty uh, humanity is uh, as it concerns the environment, our capacity of the brain, that it's not a perfect organ, that uh, 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 that we should not uh, use the hubris that were made in the image of God, more like in the image of the chimpanzee. <laughs> well, and, and, and before we leave, I would like to, to wish your uh, listeners uh, that their brain shrinks less than expected for their age. I love that that's the signature on your email. I saw that the other day and I smiled to myself and I thought, well, that is a wonderful blessing and a beautiful message to end on. Professor George Paxanos, I'm so delighted to have spoken to you. I am terrified uh, because I just turned 49. So I think, you know, gosh, I, I missed 49 years of good behavior but there is hope for me yet. And um, I do exercise. I do fast. Um, I don't drink as, a, as much as I used to. And um, I'm really, really just delighted to have had this conversation with you. Thank you. Pleasure to have been with you. See you, Mahara. Thank you.